Um, the scripture reading for today is found in Colossians 2, 11 through 13. That's Colossians 2, verses 11 through 13. And it reads, In him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised, him, who raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your trespasses, and the circumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. May God add a special blessing to the reading of his word. Amen. That has one of these little ribbons, I would encourage you today in our sermon, and as we continue through Colossians, just stick it there in Colossians 2. I'm just going to make it easier for you to turn back there because we're going to be going to different scriptures. So just pull out your little ribbon, let it get some work today, put it there in Colossians chapter 2. The title of our message is Circumcised and Baptized. Let's have, I'm just going to have another prayer before we open God's word together. So let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for the title of that song, We Are Homeward Bound. And we pray that as we open the Bible together, that as we study the truths, the realities that are found there, Lord, that you would shine them into our hearts. We pray for a living experience. Do a great work today. Do mighty things, Lord, that we know not. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As always, a refresher of what we looked at last time to give you the context. We looked at verses 11 through 15 of Colossians chapter 2. I'm sorry, we did not. We looked at verses 6 through 10 of Colossians chapter 2. And this is what we saw in those verses. We were encouraged to continue growing in our relationship with God. Amen? Amen. Paul uses the words in verse 6 and 7, this word, these words of walking in Him and being built up in Him, to refer to this continual growth in Christ. And we learned in Acts chapter 20 and in Jude chapter 1, we learned by what means that we are to grow up into Jesus. Do you remember what those two things were, according to those scriptures? Oh friends, tell me, talk to me. What were those? What? How are we built up according to those two verses? It was by the Word of God and by praying in the Holy Spirit. Remember we looked at those verses? This is how we continue to grow in our walk with Christ. In verse 8, we were warned against to guard ourselves against philosophies and traditions of men that are not according to Christ. We talked about some of those. Do you remember that? Verses 9 and 10, there Paul shared with us the truth that Jesus Christ is fully God. Amen. And we are complete in Him. Amen? Amen? This is what we looked at last time. And now we have three short verses. We're going to look at this morning, but there's, there's beauty in, in, in them. Verses 11 through 13, starting in verse 11. Verse 10, he told us we are complete in him, and now he's reminding the believers of these wonderful truths of what it means to be in Christ. Verse 11, Colossians 2. In him, that is in Jesus, in him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ. Hmm. Now, to understand what Paul is saying here, we must understand what circumcision is and where it originated. That's what we're going to look at right now. So I'm going to take you back in your, in your Bible memory to Genesis chapter 15. 15 through 21. You can turn there if you want. We're not going to read the verses. We're just going to share the story with you this morning. You remember the story of Abraham. 
If you remember that story, raise your hand high. The story of Abraham. God called Abraham to leave his family and to go out into a place that God would show him. Guess what Abraham did? He obeyed. By faith. Hebrews says, not knowing where he was going, he trusted God that God would lead him. Amen. He went out and began to follow the Lord. Then God, in that, in that call to come out, he promised that in him, Abraham, all the nations would be blessed. A promise that looked forward that through his lineage, Christ would come. That's what it says in Galatians. God tells him, you're going to have a son. Through him, again, the Christ would come. All nations will be blessed through him. The problem was, Abraham was old. Right? He heard the promise from God that through him he would have a son. According to Genesis 15, God believed, Abraham believed God. He believed him. Even though he was old, he believed that God could do it. And the Bible says that he was accounted to him for righteousness. But guess what happened? Abraham, in that moment, when he heard that promise of God, when he heard the voice of God, he believed that promise. Not only was he old, but his wife was old as well. As Abraham comes and tells his wife the promise that God had made him, they believed at first, but then Sarah said, Well, you know, I'm old, you're old. Hmm, we're going to have, God said we're going to have kids? Physically speaking, that's impossible. Maybe, maybe we need to help God fulfill His promise. Maybe He's not capable of doing it. We need to help Him out, you know, fulfill it in our own way. As a matter of fact, I, Sarah speaking, I have a, a handmaid named Hagar. She's younger. I mean, she's mine, so technically, if you have a baby with her, then that's my baby. Maybe that's the way that God would have us fulfill the promise. And sadly to say, Abraham heeded the voice of his wife and did the very thing that she said. They had a son, Abraham and Hagar. What was his name? Ishmael. Ishmael. Ten years go by. Ishmael grows up to be a young man. Abraham's thinking, this is, this is the promised son. Let look you there. I got, I got the promise. But then guess what? God comes to him again. And repeats his promise. You're going to have a son. Abraham's like, Lord, remember Ishmael. What are you talking about? I already have one. He said, no, 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 no. I told you very clearly that you and Sarah are going to have a son. And Abraham realized in that moment, the conviction of the Holy Spirit came upon him that he had tried to fulfill God's promise in his own way. Not fully depending on God to fulfill his promise. He heard God's word and he believed it. Then God told him, Okay, you've heeded my voice. You're trusting me now again to fulfill my promise. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you the sign of circumcision. That was, most of us know what it is, but that is where the piece of the skin of that Abraham's private part was removed. <laughs> God gave him that physical sign to show something important. Circumcision, friends, was an outward sign that Abraham had given up his attempts to fulfill God's promise in his own way and his own strength. It was a sign that he believed God could do for him what he could not do for himself. Do you follow this? This is where this physical sign of circumcision was given, and this is what it represented. It was a physical demonstration of the spiritual condition of Abraham's heart. Did you hear that? You follow me this morning? Amen. This outward sign of circumcision, this from cutting off of the flesh, was an outward sign of something that was taking place in Abraham's heart spiritually. And this is Paul's argument in Romans chapter 4, basically the whole chapter. I'm just going to read verse 11 for you. This is what Paul says in Romans 4 concerning Abraham and this sign of circumcision. Romans 4.11 says, Abraham received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith he had while still uncircumcised. 
I'm going to read it one more time so you can catch what he's saying. Abraham received the sign of circumcision, this physical manifestation, outward work. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal or as a proof of the faith which he had, the righteousness of faith that which he had, while still uncircumcised. Translation, the outward circumcision was just a sign of the righteousness of faith which he had in his heart. Do you follow that? Amen. This is where circumcision was first given. And ever after that, God told Abraham and all his descendants to be circumcised as again as a symbol that they were walking in faith, trusting that God would fulfill his promise. But now we're here in Colossians chapter 2. With that understanding of where it originated and what it's to symbolize, listen to what the Bible says. Again, verse 11. In Him, that is in Jesus, you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. That is to say that the circumcision that we receive as believers in Jesus is without hands. That is to say not a physical procedure, but a spiritual procedure on the heart. Go to Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. Again, Paul's coming to his conclusion here in Romans 2, verse 28 and 29. When you're there, say amen. amen. Romans 2, 28 29. For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one, where? Inwardly. Inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart. In the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. Could it be any clearer this morning? His words are super clear, friends. Circumcision is not, we don't, we're not outwardly circumcised. It was supposed to be simply a symbol of what takes place in the heart. And that is Paul's reasoning here. He is not a Jew, verse 29, who is one outwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart. Back to our verse there in Colossians 2. Use your ribbon. That's what Paul is saying here. The same very thought he shared in Romans, he's sharing it here. A circumcision made without hands. A circumcision of the heart. So what does it mean for God to circumcise our hearts? Look at the verse, verse 11. In him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. And what does this mean practically? By putting off the what? Body. The body of the sins of the flesh. This is what it means, friends. Now, what specifically are these sins that are being removed from our hearts? He talks about them in Colossians 3. We're not going to go into details reading that now because we're going to get there eventually. But just to, just to give you a picture so you can practically know what, what does it mean for Christ to circumcise our hearts, to remove the body of sins in our life? Look at verse 5 and verse 8 of Colossians 3. He says, therefore, since you've been risen with Christ, you've had this circumcision of heart, therefore put to death your members which are on the earth. Here he names them. Fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Verse 8. But now you yourselves are to put off all these. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Verse 9. Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his deeds. There they are. He's spelling them out, friends. To be circumcised of heart is to have the body of the sins of the flesh removed. Just as that physical flesh was cut off and removed from Abraham... So we have these things, anger and malice and evil desire, removed from our lives, from our hearts. You follow that this morning? 
This is the circumcision. Paul is reminding the believers here in verse 11 that they have received. Look at, at the end of the verse. How did they receive this? Christ. By the circumcision of Christ. The work that He had accomplished in their life. It means, friends, the circumcision of heart that we do not attempt to try to fulfill God's promise in our own strength like Abraham. We realize like Abraham that in and of ourselves our flesh is incapable, unable to fulfill, but we trust that Christ is able to do this for us. Amen. This is what it means. This circumcision of of heart. It is by the circumcision of Christ. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 30. This is not a new idea to the New Testament. Deuteronomy 30 says the same thing. Listen to this promise this morning. Deuteronomy 30, verse 6. God here is giving them again, repeating the, the blessings and the cursings. Listen to this promise. Ah, how wonderful. Deuteronomy 30, verse 6. And the Lord God, your God, will circumcise your what? Heart. Your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. Who will do it? God. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart. Amen. This was the promise back then. Amen. And it's the promise today. That Christ, by Him, by what He's accomplished, because He was cut off on the cross, so our sins can be cut off in our life. This is the beauty, friends. It is what Jesus can accomplish. Back to Colossians 2. Notice in our verse that we just read in verse 30 and in Romans 2 and what he's talking about here. This is a circumcision of the heart. It is a change of outward behavior. Amen? Amen. It is. There is a change of outward behavior, but catch it. It goes deeper than that. Are you following me? It goes deeper than just outward behavior. It actually changes our hearts. That means our thoughts and desires. This is what God wants to get at. God works a change in us where we come to love what is good and hate what is sin. We are changed from the inside out. Amen? Amen. Amen. And not the other way around, or not just solely, outwardly. God is interested in our hearts. <coughs> Hear me this morning. I'm, you need to catch it. God is interested in our hearts. Our thoughts, our desires, our motives. This is what He's really trying to get after in, in each and every person. Because He knows that if He gets the heart... Guess what? He gets everything else. He gets everything else. If he has your heart, then he's going to have your time. If he has your heart, he's going to have your best energies to work for him. If he has your heart, he gets it all. Amen. Because our heart is the seat of everything in this world. Everything that we do in our life, if we're doing something, if we're striving after this money or that thing, it's because our hearts are in it. And we want it. That's the motive force behind our actions. It's our hearts. And this is what God is after. The circumcision of the heart. But ah, how slow we are to give our hearts. We'd rather give our money or just give a little bit of time here and just do that little thing. But to, but to give our hearts, ah, uh, we're slow. Here is where we can learn a physical lesson or we can learn a lesson from the physical circumcision that will teach us about the spiritual. God always wants to teach us lessons, amen? amen. From the physical to the spiritual. Here's where we can learn one. Physical circumcision, guess what? That was a delicate matter. 
Amen. Amen. <laughs> that was a sensitive area. And so it is with the spiritual circumcision. This is a sensitive area, friends. The heart. It's a sensitive area. It's private. Take a knife anywhere but there. And physical circumcision. And so it is in the spiritual. Lord, do you can have this, I'll do this for you, but but you to get to the heart, there's a lesson to be learned. So you have to really trust someone to circumcise you physically speaking, amen? amen? To come that close to you with a knife, you have to really trust that person. And so it is in spiritual, spiritually speaking. We must really trust Jesus Christ. If we don't trust Him, we think He's coming at us with that blade to, to kill us, to destroy our lives, to just wreck us, and oh, He's taking all of my fun away, now He's just, He's ruined me. No, no, no. He is a physician and not a butcher. Physicians cut to heal, butchers cut to kill. Jesus only uses his blade to bring healing, to remove disease from our life. And we have to come to the place where we trust him. Right. Fully trust him to do his work in our life. Guess what? Physical circumcision, it was painful. You read the stories there. In the Old Testament, where some, especially as older people were circumcised, they were weak. I mean, yeah, it's a painful process. And spiritually speaking, it can be painful to lose some of those sins of the flesh that we hold on to so tightly, or rather that have, have their hold on us so tightly. That can be a painful thing. It can be difficult to let that thing go that you so thought was nurturing you and helping you and giving you true joy when really it wasn't. But guess what? Trust Him. Trust God to do the work and that though there is a little pain, it's going to be for the better in the end. Beautiful lessons we can learn. Paul is reminding the believers here in verse 11 that they have had this experience in Jesus. Did you catch that? He's, he's reminding them. Look at the verse again. Colossians 2.11 In him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. He's reminding them. Look, this is your experience. You had a change of heart. Jesus has set you free. The question is this morning, is that your experience? Have you been circumcised by the circumcision of Christ? Has He given you a new heart? Has your anger and lustful thoughts been subdued? Do you have love, joy, Patience, self-control? And do you look upon these characteristics, these fruits of the Spirit, do you look upon them with a desire to obtain them? Do you look upon them as truly lovely and truly something worth to obtain? Do you believe that Christ can do this for you? May your answer be that of Mary, the mother of Jesus, to the angel. She said, Let it be to me according to your word. Amen. May that be Amen. your answer this morning, friends. Amen. And if you've not received this circumcision of the heart, hear Deuteronomy 30, verse 6. God will accomplish it for you. Amen. You must trust Him and surrender. Amen. Believe that His power is able. Can you imagine? Almost a hundred years old in Abraham having a child? That, physically speaking, is impossible. The flesh is not able to do that. But God did it. Amen. This, these are the lessons he's trying to teach us. You may say, it's impossible for me to overcome. I've tried so long to overcome that addiction or that thing or to surrender this or to obtain patience. 
physically in myself, in my flesh, no good thing dwells. Right. And you're right. In you, in and of you, you can't. But God is able. The question is, do you trust Him? Do we really believe? Are we really open for Him to come in and do some heart work? Because He can. These are, these are the thoughts here in verse 11. Wonderful thoughts, amen? amen. Challenging thoughts. These thoughts of receiving a new heart and dying to sin and self led Paul's mind right to the symbol that represents this experience in the Christian life in the next verse. I'm going to, read it, I'm going to say that again. These thoughts here in verse 11 of receiving a new heart and dying to sin and self led Paul's mind, as he's meditating on that in verse 11, it led his mind right in the next verse to the very symbol that represents this experience in the Christian life. That is baptism. Look at verse 12. Buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. You see what he did there? These thoughts of dying to sin, he says, look, you were circumcised with the circumcision of Christ, this heart work, and you were buried with him. Jesus died and was buried. Guess what? So did you. You died with him. You died to sin. That sin was removed from your life. You were buried with him, but you weren't just buried. Buried with him in which you also were what? Raised, Raised with him. For Christ was not just buried, but he rose again. Amen. Through the working of God, and we have this same experience, he says, by faith in the working of God. Amen. He says it the same way in Romans 6. Go there with me now. Romans chapter 6. Paul's saying the very same thing. Flushing it out so we can really meditate on this and, and grasp it. Romans 6. Beginning in verse 1. I want you to see. I want you to see the parallels here between Romans 6 and these few verses that we're looking at here in, in Colossians 2. I'll give you a minute to turn there. Romans chapter 6. One second. Mm-hmm. Romans 6. Verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? What's the answer? Certainly not. Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? See this? this, is, this these are the thoughts in verse 11 of chapter 2. This circumcision of heart. How can you continue in the body of the sins of the flesh if they've been cut off? You can't. And that's Paul's reasoning here. And then he jumps straight from dying to sin to this thought of baptism. Look at verse 2. Verse 3. Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his what? Into his death. That we were baptized, as many as were baptized into Jesus were baptized into his death. Verse 4. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. You see what he's doing here? Just as Jesus died, was buried, and rose again, so when we're baptized, we are partaking of that very death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. We die to our sin, it's left in the grave, and we're resurrected to new life. Amen. This is what he's saying. Verse 5. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the, what is it? 
the body of sin. That's the same language in Colossians 2. The body of sin might be what? Done away with. Done away with or destroyed that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Wow. This is his argument in Romans 6. Saying the same thing back now back in Colossians 2 that he's saying here. These parallel passages. Baptism, friends, is an outward symbol of what has taken place in the heart and the life of the believer. Amen. You see, we are as Christians, we are not circumcised as proof that our hearts have been changed, as a symbol of our hearts being changed, but what are we? We are baptized as a symbol that our heart and life has been changed by Christ. The water doesn't change us. Right. It is Jesus that changes you. Amen. In baptism, you are proclaiming that you have accepted Christ's death for your sins and that you died with Him. And just as He was resurrected, so you too died to sin and were resurrected to a new life. You follow that this morning? This is what baptism is a symbol of. This death to sin and newness of life is possible and dependent on the fact that Jesus died and rose again. I'm going to say that one more time. Catch it carefully, friends. Us dying to sin and self and coming to a new life is possible and solely dependent on the fact that Jesus died and rose again. Amen. That's what it's saying in the verse. Verse 12. Notice, we are buried with Him. Amen. This is not your own separate burial. For you cannot die. You are buried with Him and raised with Him. We partake of His death and resurrection. Are you catching? This is beautiful, friends. This is the gospel. That we actually partake of the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ by faith. Amen. We partake of it. it. He gives it to us. He accounts it to us and actually gives it to us in our experience. When we look and live and believe. His death enables me to die to sin. His resurrection empowers me to live a new life. Absolutely. One more time, because they're sweet words from glory. His death enables me to die to sin. It enables me, it empowers me. His resurrection empowers me to live a new life. Amen. What does verse 12 say? How is this possible? By faith in the working of God. Did you see it? Read it again. Buried with Him in baptism, in which you also were raised with Him through faith in the working of God. This is how it's accomplished. By looking and believing that Jesus truly did live a sinless life. That He died the perfect death, was buried, and that He did rise again. And believing that He did all of this for me, personally. So that I may experience dying to sin and living again to God. Amen. He did all of this. And as we by faith look upon Him in all His fullness, God comes into the heart and does His work of circumcision. Amen. Notice that the change of heart takes place before you are baptized. That's right. Did you catch it? Yes. Verse 11, you're circumcised in heart. Verse 12, you're baptized. Not the other way around. That's right. Peter said in the book of Acts chapter 2 or 3, repent and be baptized. Repentance comes first. Baptism comes after. The word. Some people get baptized at a younger age because their friends do it or you know, they feel peer pressure and do it because they know it's the right thing to do without a real surrender and acceptance of Jesus. It happens. It happens. 
Some were never fully explained what baptism is supposed to represent, and they just do it hastily without having a heart experience with Christ. This doesn't mean that the person who does have the heart experience is perfect and doesn't have to grow. No, there's growth involved, as we just read in verses 6 and 7. That's right. But they made the decision. They just fully surrendered and said, Lord, I'm willing to walk with you all the way. I'm letting you remove those things from my life, and I believe in your power to do it through you. So what we learn from this, friends, is the act of baptism done apart from the change of heart is not a true baptism according to the Bible. Did you catch it? It's not. The act of baptism done apart from the change of heart is not a true baptism according to the Bible because it ruins the symbol. There's, the water doesn't change you. If there's nothing behind the symbol, it's empty. So has Jesus changed your heart this morning? Praise God. If so, have you been baptized to express publicly that your life has been united with Him? Is your heart with Christ this morning? If so, have you been baptized to express publicly your life has been united with Him? If so, Praise the King. Trust Him to keep you. Amen. If not, I would encourage you to make that public declaration in the watery grave. Amen. Make, haste. Make, haste. make haste. Pray about it, friends. Follow the biblical <coughs> line here as we see in Colossians. Beautiful. Beautiful symbolism. Just as we go down in that water... It's a symbol that we are dying. We are being buried in the grave. We're there, and then we're resurrected to new life. That's what it is. That's what Paul is saying that they had experienced here in verse 12. And now our last verse for this morning, verse 13. Colossians 2, 13. We'll read verse 12 again. Buried with him in baptism in which you also were raised with Him through faith in the working of God, who raised Him from the dead, and you, being dead in your trespasses and the, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, He has made alive together with Him, having forgiven you all your trespasses. Praise the Lord. And you, Paul says, this is not the first time that he used this language. Look at chapter 1, verse 21. Of Colossians. He does a very similar language and style here in chapter 1. We've already looked at this verse previously, but I want you to see the connection. Verse 21, And you, who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled. Mm. Now look back at verse 13. Colossians 2, And you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, He has made alive together with Him, have forgiven you all your trespasses. You see what He's doing? Same thing He's saying in a different way. Reminding the believers that they were dead in sin. They were dead in their trespasses and the uncircumcision of their flesh and of their heart. But even though they were dead, He made them alive. Amen. I can't say it any better than Paul does in Ephesians 2. Turn with me there. Ephesians 2. Verse 1. Ephesians 2, verse 1. Listen to these words of life. Ephesians chapter 2, just a few books before, Colossians. And we're going to read verses 1 through 5. Listen to these words. This is a parallel passage here. Talking about what he's talking about in verse 13. Here we go. Ephesians 2 verse 1. And you. There he goes again. And you he made alive. Who were what? Dead, Dead in trespasses and sins. In which you once also walked according to the course of this world. According to the prince of the power of the air. The Spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. 
among whom also we also conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God, verse 4, But God, who is rich in mercy, because of His great love with which He has loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us to sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Amen. Even when we were dead, walking our own desires, doing our own thing, Christ came to us in the person of His Spirit and began to speak His love song to us. And began to woo us to himself. And says, come away with me, my love. Come away from the things of this world. They have nothing for you. And we heard that still small voice. Though we are still in the desires of the flesh, we heard that voice of Jesus and the Spirit. And we may have neglected it for a time, but yet he comes like a wave that crashes on the sea. Though it goes back down, it just continues to flow. Keeps crashing. Keeps stronger coming. And the Holy Spirit comes into our life. And though we may resist, He keeps on after us That's right. until we get a full revelation of our weakness and a full revelation of His goodness, and we surrender. And all of this is because of His mercy and of His great love with which He has loved us. Amazing love that while we were yet in our trespasses, dead in sin, that God made us alive together with Christ. And back in, again back to verse 13. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven all your trespasses. Amen. And this is how he makes us alive. By the forgiveness, by the power of his blood. One lesson I want you to take from this verse, friends, is if God did this for you while you did not love Him. Amen? That's what the text is saying. He did all of this. Listen to this truth. As you are now walking with Jesus, listen to me closely. As you are now making a decision to walk with Christ in His Word, and you're seeking to follow Him and walk in that circumcision of heart, as you are doing this, remember this. That even if you, as, if you struggle... If you find yourself stumbling and falling and separating yourself from your one true love, remember this. As God did not first choose you because you were high, so He will not forsake you because you are low. Mm. You didn't hear it. Mm. Amen, brother. As God did not first choose you because you were high, mm. so He will not forsake you because you are low. Amen. Amen. Amazing love. Yes. Remember that, friends. That if you find yourself in a struggle, to not be cast down. Mm -hmm. For Christ is able to pick you up. Yes. He's the one who did it in the first place. Yes. Yes. This is amazing love, friends. Paul is reminding them here. He wanted the believers to remember all the great things that Jesus had accomplished for them. Paul knew that a fresh remembrance of Jesus and His salvation is the only thing that can encourage and strengthen a believer. Did you hear that? Paul knew that a fresh remembrance of Jesus and His salvation is the only thing that can truly encourage and strengthen a believer. And so here he reminds them that they had been circumcised in heart. They had publicly expressed that through baptism. That Jesus had accomplished this wonderful work. And that's what he's doing in verse 13. He's summarizing that work. And you, again I'm going to read it. Verse 13. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him having forgiven you all of your trespasses. 
Paul encouraged the believers to remember. And friends, I close my sermon out this morning by encouraging you to remember what God has accomplished for you. Here's my appeal to you this morning. Take some time this Sabbath, when you, when you go home and you're just there with your family by yourself, take some time this Sabbath after church and look back at all that Jesus has done for you personally. How He has provided for all your needs all these years. Think about how He has protected and delivered you time and time again. Think of where you would be without Him. Without Him working in your life, consider the pain that Christ endured so that you could have peace today. Think of Him standing before the Father right now, praying for you in heaven. Picture Him coming in glory to take you home to be with Him forever. Amen. Think about these things today. I challenge you. Most of you won't. Most of you are going to go home and forget. But I challenge you. Be intentional. Think of, Go home today and think about these thoughts that I just said. Picture what Jesus has accomplished for you personally. What He's done in your life. How he, Where you would be. Try to picture where you would be without Him. Spiritual and circumcision. That's what we need. Think about what He has endured for you on the cross so that you might have peace today. Picture Him standing before the Father there in all His glory, in those priestly garments, pleading your prayers. He's taking your prayers and making them His own and putting them before the Father. And picture Him coming in glory to take you home again. If you will take time to think about these things, guess what it's going to do? Your heart's going to be circumcised. It's going to be changed. And even if it's already, it's going to be a fresh renewing. This is what God wants for us. Amen. Let us read the verse, three verses again together, and then we'll have our closing song. Colossians 2, verse 11 through 13. In Him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with Him in baptism, in which you also were raised with Him through faith in the working of God who raised Him from the dead. And you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, He has made alive together with Him, having forgiven you all your trespasses. Let us stand and sing our closing hymn, which is...